Hello and welcome to the first session of day two of the QS Europe virtual event. My name is Rachel Martin. I'm the Global Director for Sustainability at Elsevier and I'm super excited to be moderating today's session. We're looking at European students' perspectives and the Sustainable Development Goals, otherwise known as SDGs or Global Goals. To set the context for today, the SDGs really are a blueprint, which was agreed by the United Nations Member States back in 2015, and it provides this blueprint of which we are going to globally achieve a more inclusive, sustainable and equitable future for both people and planet. Now, I think many of you in the audience are going to agree with me that research and innovation are critical in trying to achieve these ambitious targets by the deadline outlined as 2030. And so today's session, we're going to look at the students' perspectives within this context. We're going to look at some critical skills about developing global mindsets. We're going to explore communication and retention strategies. And then we're going to really discover some concrete examples of how the SDG framework has been applied um, within the university context. So let's get started with our first speaker, Sabrina Stark. She is the University Partnerships Manager at Absolute Internship. She's based in Barcelona, Spain. And she's the co-creator and moderator for the Absolute Intern Remote 2020 and Evolve 2021 webinar series, which was focused on host companies and student realities. And Sabrina is really going to give us some insights about how studying abroad programs um, like Absolute Internship can contribute to a global mindset and develop some valuable skills. So over to you, Sabrina. Hi, and thank you for joining Absolute Internship for our session on international students and remote remote international internships. Absolute Internship was founded in 2009. Uh, we have placed over 5,000 students uh, from 53 different nationalities in over 800 companies across Europe, Asia, and Canada in over 30 industries. My name is Sabrina Stark and I am the University Partnerships Manager um, and I am the co-creator and host of our webinar series, uh, The Remote 2020 on International Students and Remote Internships was our most popular by far uh, from universities and from students um, as there's a lot of interest for remote internships from international students. Um, so today with us, I'm very excited to have three of our students joining um, so they can share a little bit more about their experiences and what they have learned. Um, so we have Valentina, who is an economics and management student from Universita Catolica del Sacro Core in Italy, and she is from Russia. And she was a finance intern for Scribe, which is a company based in London. Then we have Sorin, who is a computer science student at the University of Westminster in the UK and is originally from Romania. And he is an IT intern for Maxon Technology uh, that works in Montreal and France. And we have Amber with us, who is a business student from the University of Leeds uh, in the UK. And she's originally from Hong Kong. And she's doing a business development internship for EGTV that works in Montreal and Dubai. So before we get to their experiences, we just wanted to share some data in terms of international students. Um, so our applications, if we look back to 2019, 25% came from international students. International meaning that their country of citizenship is not the same as their university country. And for enrollments, we had around 24% of our programs were international students enrolling in the travel programs. Then when we moved to 2020, where we launched our remote program, we had 38% of our applications came from international students, and then 44% of the enrollments were international students. So we saw a huge increase in terms of enrollments for international students in our programs. Um, as of today, so of June 2021, um, we're currently at an increase of 342% of number of international students enrolling in the remote program. 
And a fun fact is that 30% of all of our international remote students are from China, um, studying at universities around the world. Um, so we're very excited to have all of these students in our program and truly making it an international experience and cohort. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, have our students speak and they can talk about their experiences. Um, so Valentina, if you don't mind just starting off and sharing about your internship. So why did I choose a remote international internship? Back to one year ago when I was looking for a job as a bachelor student, it has been already quite a challenge because the COVID was there and it would be quite hard to find an internship as an um, economics and management student in Milan because everything was closed and people were more busy with other things rather than offering jobs to students. So I found an absolute internship company which offered a lot of remote experience. And I felt that it could be an opportunity for me to partake, to be a better candidate for my future job as a um, future finance professional. So that's why I decided to take a chance and try it. First of all, I saw that, well, while studying all of the theory at my university, it could give me a lot of practice and I could apply it in the company which would pick me. And in my case, it was Scribe, which is a company that combines artificial intelligence and finances for their goals and new financial technologies. I felt that working in London while already being an international student in Milan could give me a lot of competitive advantage and would make me more familiar with an international environment. As working with different cultures is a challenge and it takes time to learn. Also, I knew that while finance is a very broad sphere, working would make me understand what I would want to concentrate on the most in finances. And that really helped me because then while choosing master's degree, I will have all the experience in finances in my hands to make a right choice for my future career. So I can surely say that an international remote internship has influenced my future career goals. As first of all, um, working in finances these days is becoming more and more online and remote. Having an experience can help me, can help other people hire me because they will know I already knew how to work online and I will do correct at this job. Working at Scribe has already influenced my future. As one week ago, I have received an offer to work at a finance company in Milan. And that's amazing because it's in the city where I wanted to work, in the language I feel most comfortable to work in, and in the area where I dream to work. So what's left for me is to pass an interview and start my job there. So yeah, I can surely say that remote international experience and internship surely can affect you, the way you see the world and the way your future goes. Thank you, Valentina. Um, Sorting, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and your thoughts? Well, the reason I chose a remote internship is because I wanted to get into the field and build a career in computer science. Also, I always wanted to be able to work from any place I want, so I would be able to travel in the meantime. In short, I can say that choosing a remote internship was a great fit for me. The cultural skills. Well, I'm a Romanian who studies in London, living in Germany. I spent two summers of my life in the United States with the work and travel program. And right now I'm working in Montreal. So I can say that throughout this experience, I developed plenty of cultural skills. From those, the most important ones that I can talk about is valuing diversity, be kind with people, and always have a good attitude towards everyone even though you might not agree with them or you might not like them. You have to be kind and show a good attitude. Right now I have a way better idea than what I had before because when you are in uni, you study and you go through a lot of areas and you do plenty of things, but until you actually work with them, you are not aware of what you actually want. Being an internet max and give me that. Their mission 
uh, reducing the carbon footprint of the buildings motivated me a lot. They are using uh, data analysis and machine algorithms in order to make a building greener. Also, the vibe is always there in a meeting. They are always helpful. And uh, this thing made me feel like I belong to a group and I'm part of something, which I believe it's really important for a student that just finished his studies. Also, right now, after doing this internship, I um, have a way better understanding in, of an interview. Let's say before this, I was kind of desperate to make a, a company like me when I was having an interview. Right now, I have a lot, of, a lot more confidence and also I'm not just going to be an interviewee, I'm going to be an interviewer for them because I really need to know that I would like to work for that company and I would really like to know that they are a good fit for me, which I believe is a big change in, in my mindset. Thank you, Sorin. Um, Amber, can you talk to us a little bit about your internship and, and your experiences? Um, the reason why I chose um, a remote international internship is mainly because of um, COVID-19 um, due to the global pandemic. And from my school website and found um, absolute internship, which provides um, a flexible and customizable um, internship program for me. And I found that it will shoot me well. So um, this is the reason why I chose um, that program as an international business student. And it is important that to experience working in a multicultural environment. So this internship will help me to gain this experience. So as I'm, a, I'm from Hong Kong and I have been studying in UK for three years. And then now I'm working um, an internship in Montreal, which um, these people speak uh, France and English as um, their main language, but it is not my mother language. So the, the experience in Hong Kong and UK have taught me that um, don't be shy to communicate with each other using um, the language that you are not familiar with. Just break to be asked and then encourage, um, to be encouraged that to know more others um, um, people's cultural backgrounds and respect others. Um, I want to travel around in the in my future career path, and then this internship have gave me um, the charisma of um, different cultural backgrounds. So it made me more certain that I'm willing to travel around and then not only working in. Um, my hometown, Hong Kong, not my um, comfort zone, China and UK, but also work globally with others, different countries, um, in different countries with different people from different cultural backgrounds and different religions and different colors. So this internship has really given me an invaluable um, experience that make me more sure about the field that I wish to work for in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, moving on just quickly to share some of our recruiting techniques and tactics. Um, we really do take kind of a holistic um, approach to uh, working with students and universities. Um, of course, we have a lot of information on our website. We do specific email campaigns um, that attract uh, international students. Um, you know, phone calls is very important. Um, parent outreach outreach as parents might have questions about the program and the value of it. Um, social media is a big part as well, you know, working with students. So um, we have testimonials, we have takeovers. Uh, we really want to connect students with students so they understand what the experience is about and what they're gaining. Um, our blog is amazing. We have so many testimonials. Um, from students, interviews with them. We also have interviews with host companies. So really just getting the word out there about what an international remote internship entails. Um, attending campus fairs, um, whether in person or virtually, and definitely our ambassadors. So ambassadors are students that had a great experience in the program and they really just want to share this experience with others, explain you know, what it was like for them, what skills they learned, and kind of how this is guiding their career in 
in the future. Um, so all of these techniques really make an impact when reaching out to international students for a program. And of course, um, the mobile phone. Uh, as you know, students are always on their phone. 75% um, of Gen Zers use their smartphones more than any other device. Um, so anything that you're sending, you're doing, has to be adapted to the mobile phone um, and easy to look at. So everything that we design, it's thinking in those terms of someone using a mobile phone. Um, when reaching out, as we mentioned before, calls are really important and text messages messaging. Um, so text messages have a 98% open rate. Um, so we always send text messages um, to reach out, to remind students, to encourage them, um, because they know that they're going to be opening them. Um, and then just to sum up, uh, you want to make sure that things are simple. It's easy to understand. It's very user friendly. Um, we make video tutorials and step by step on how to do the application, where to go on the website, how to do everything that you need. Um, and then for international students um, in particular, you know, they're going to want to know how does this work for their degree? Um, do they have to, you know, do anything in particular um, for financial aid? Are there scholarships? Are there some sort of um, support for them? So we always have that information available depending on their institution. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, we encourage you to check us out on Instagram and TikTok. Um, we're constantly posting um, experiences from our students, takeovers, tips to future interns, um, and much more. So we really would enjoy you to join our absolute tribe. Um, and we just all would like to say thank you today uh, for joining us in this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sabrina. I think that was an amazing sort of insight into how those programs can really contribute to um, a global mindset. And it was great to hear the insights from those interns um, who obviously had successful um, internships. And I think this is a perfect segue to start thinking through how universities and institutions might adapt their recruitment strategies and more fundamentally their communication strategies if they want to attract and retain a diverse student population, which in itself is a goal of, of uh, sustainability. So this brings us to our next speaker, Emma Froud, Head of Business Development at Unibuddy. She's located in the UK with a 15 year career in higher education focused on student recruitment. She joined Unibuddy in 2018 and is now focused on growing this peer to peer platform. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you and we will get started. And it was fantastic, wasn't it great to hear from those students in Sabrina's presentation? I really enjoyed hearing from the students and, and hearing their voice and their experience of those internships. So I really am delighted to be here today. It's fantastic to join you. And as Rachel said, having spent 15 years in marketing and recruitment in higher education in the UK, I'm particularly keen to explore how this period, I suppose, during COVID of, of disruption and uncertainty, and how this really has changed and affected the behaviours and also the expectations uh, of students in terms of the way that they communicate, how they consume information, uh, and what this really means for marketing and recruitment professionals in terms of their ability to attract and retain a diverse and inclusive student population. So this accelerated digital transformation uh, across all sectors, really, you know, this, of course, is something that's here to stay, I believe. And I think it's something that uh, higher education has embraced that creativity and agility has really seen the flipping of, of learning and teaching. But not only that, as I say, communication with prospective students and really affected study choices and students, uh, students recruitment journey and pathway into higher education. Because the pandemic has not just caused this sort of digital transformation, but of course, highlighted the vulnerability of the planet and really affected students key priorities and the changing nature of the way they make their study choices. So I really am pleased to be here representing Unibuddy and one of the things that's been hugely rewarding for me personally is seeing how we've really helped so many of our university partners. Unibuddy work with over 450 universities worldwide uh, and what we've really been able to do is help our partners manage this transition to a new normal and how they face these new, new realities to really deliver a high quality service to their prospective and current students. So as we can see here, 
we've actually looked at a lot of statistics and data that's really informed how we've developed our products at Unibuddy. Um, we've got the Global Web, in Web Index report that's really shown that 60% more time is spent on social media and start smartphones during the COVID period. So we're really seeing that students uh, are looking to consume information on their terms. You know, I think what we've really seen and highlighted is the flexibility that students now require in terms of the way that they access and consume information. And as marketing and recruitment professionals, I think historically there's been a bit of a tendency for us to decide what students want to know uh, and when they might want to know it, whether that's about recruitment cycles, accommodation information, whether it's about uh, sustainability parties and commitments of institutions, whether that's about admissions inquiries, or of course the social aspects of studying at university. And this willingness to change that universities have displayed is really is vital because what's undeniable from the hundreds of thousands of students that use anybody's technology is that students are engaging um, in ways with new behaviors and new technologies and that really has evolved and students are claiming the high importance on speaking to universities outside of normal working hours so the ability to actually have on-demand uh, events taster events open days that virtual technology really has uh, changed the way that students are consuming information and they want to have their answers que uh, questions answered um, almost instantly and of course by having that peer-to-peer -peer communication by being able to click to chat to talk to a current student they really can have that credible authentic student voice which enables them to really identify with an organization and create that sense of belonging that sense of community uh, which is also important particularly in a post-covid world where we've all suffered from the realities of being separated from friends from family uh, and not being able to engage in that personal one-to-one -one basis is becoming increasingly important to students. There really is a universal desire to engage directly with current students and we're seeing students accessing more user generated content. I think the days of sort of glossy prospectuses and uh, and really sort of branded collateral is something that we are are seeing changing. And a characteristic of, of Generation Z, of the prospective students that we're talking with and that we're engaging with, uh, sustainability and increased awareness of, of environmental activism is something that's becoming much more talked about on Unibuddy's peer-to-peer -peer technology. And I am going to come back to that and look at some of the data analytics that we've been able to draw out of the Unibuddy platform in order to see how much more students are actually asking questions of their peers about the realities of student life and the commitments of their institutions where they're studying to enhance that level of activism and be involved in, in pertinent subjects that are really key to, to students' lifestyles today. Um, so what are students looking for? I think what really is key is human interaction. Nothing beats your students being able to really enjoy uh, the ability to create real human touch points throughout the student recruitment journey. And according to a QS survey, a relatively recent QS survey, uh, over 74% of international students have questions that they wish to direct to current students. So really making sure that those touch points, that you empower your alumni and your current student population to create really interesting, dynamic and authentic, credible content that students can act access as and when they wish to that is available in a virtual and online world and digital community is crucial to that decision making process. Of course, your website as the key touch point for institutions. It doesn't matter how many Google AdWords and how many media campaigns or social media campaigns are running. If students aren't able to easily navigate your website at the point at which they reach that, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to not have drop off in terms of those new leads and those new inquiries that you're wanting to are so vitally important to capture across your website. And what we have seen is that there's a five times higher sign up rate to click to chat to a current student than many other traditional calls to action on a university website. So in the days of, of ordering a, a prospectus, which perhaps takes two or three weeks to arrive through the post, uh, this sort of glossy collateral and marketing materials, which students are, are turning away from in today's day and age, I think, again, with a commitment to sustain, sustainability and with this commitment to environmental consciousness, students are sort of turning their back on those traditional direct mail marketing campaigns and we are seeing a five times higher sign up rate uh, to click as I say to chat to a current student and actually share those common experiences and really 
identify with a student who's done that journey before you. I think being able to create that sense of belonging and create that sense of community really provides a level of reassurance to students that is unprecedented, um, particularly with what we're seeing at Unibuddy. There's been a 900% increase in the engagement on our Unibuddy online events. Uh, we provide a service that enables universities to um, host live events with video streaming, and that has seen a 900% increase in the last 18 months. What's really come to light is this level of flexibility, the percent being able to host tailored events with much smaller groups of students on those issues that are pertinent to them has been something that institutions have been able to do on a much greater scale. That's been far more inclusive. It's enabled students from much further geographical reach and also has removed the limitations of travel across countries, across, uh, across communities in order to access face to face events and activities. So this sort of level of an ability for to remove cost implications of travel to face-to-face -face activities and to ensure that students from a variety of different backgrounds are able to engage in on online events and activities has also seen something that's enabled universities to have that um, sustainable impact to a variety of audiences which perhaps they hadn't done in pre-COVID times. Engaging content and attracting and converting students, uh, according to the Trend Creative Agency, user generated content can be over six times as effective in converting potential uh, potential customers compared to traditional branded content. Students are savvy, you know, they're savvy to our marketing and recruitment um, collateral, our website content and highly polished materials. I think they're really looking for the kind of warts and all uh, experience of those students that have gone before them where they can identify with them on a number of different characteristics. So I really can't emphasize enough how being able to deliver that peer to peer engagement is something that's crucial to any recruitment strategy for an institution at the moment. So let's have a look at these 11 million conversations. So there's been over 11 million uh, questions uh, communicated across the Unibody platform globally. Um, and there's a number of different ways in which we can look at that data and institutions that use the Unibody platform are able to access that data. There's artificial intelligence and machine learning, which provides topic labels, 42 different topic labels that will identify the nature of those conversations that are being had in the platform. Be that conversations about the safety and security of the location, be that about social impact, about clubs, societies, facilities, about students' queries, about uh, the admissions process, interviews, funding and finance. And this is just uh, an example of, of uh, the numbers of, of, of conversations that are being had primarily amongst our European business schools specifically. The data has been, been listed from there. One of the slides that I wanted to show you this morning uh, didn't quite make the final cut. But I've got a graph, actually, and I will share the slides, obviously, after the presentation this morning. Um, but what we've seen as a defining characteristic of, of Generation Z and those prospective students that are using our platform is the way that they are now asking questions about sustainability. They're asking about we did some data where we drew out our conversational data. Um, where we could show that sustainability, sustainable, environmental activism, these are all terms and terminology that have really spiked in 2020. So we hadn't seen any engagement where those kinds of terms and terminology had been used. But since 2020, that really has skyrocketed as something that's a key commitment where students are asking their fellow students studying at those institutions um, about um, their, th this, um, this area of priority and importance to them. So this personal commitment to being a sustainable citizen and this greater awareness of the SDGs as Rachel was talking about at the beginning really is widespread and it's something that really is feeding into the conversational data and the questions that students are asking of their peers. So really, what's the what's the sort of take home? We haven't got long this morning. So, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm limited to, to only a couple more minutes. But what I wanted to share with you, I think, really, in terms of what we what we're able to see with the peer to peer connections and, and platform that we offer at Unibuddy is that real experiences matter. 84% of students are using social media as part of their higher education research. The ability to have that greater level of personalization is key. The ability to identify with students like themselves that have done this journey before them is something that provides a level of reassurance that is uh, we're unable to offer through, through more traditional uh, technologies. So being able to offer that uh, in a flexible manner online as and when students want to engage, it really is crucial. 
Building students' confidence, 87% of students have, have said in, in recent stu studies that decisions are influenced by personalised communication, whether that's email correspondence, whether it's social media campaigns, um, whether that is in the face-to-face -face events and activities that we run. Um, it really is important to ensure that we're not delivering highly polished, branded content that's universal uh, and doesn't contain that level of personalisation that, that students are looking for. And students are in, influenced by their peer group uh, more so than any other group, parents and teachers less so now. It really is about communicating one on one uh, with those that have the same priorities and key commitments to uh, the future of the planet and this digital transformation and the new realities in the new world that we're living in. So over 80 percent of students in a recent National Student Satisfaction and Priorities report uh, has demonstrated that, that they are looking to their peer group to inform their, their decision making and their transformation transition to higher education. And this does all tie back to the Times Higher Education recent report about sustainability and student study choices. Uh, I think what we're going to be seeing is a greater commitment from universities to publicise the levels of their research and impact that they have to the sustainable development goals. And that this is something that feeds into the current commitment amongst young people that really characterises Generation Z that have a far greater commitment to sustainability uh, and environmental activism than I perhaps think previous generations have. So it's something that we are seeing increasingly discussed and talked about on the Unibody platform uh, and it's something that I think is, is very much here to stay. Um, so I'm happy to take over to the end. It's been fantastic talking with you this morning. Over to you Rachel. Thanks very much Emma. I'm quite amazed actually just how much the student experience has changed since the pandemic. Um, I mean the acceleration of the digital um, transformation about how they will be interacting with the university is just simply amazing to see in such a short period and like you said I mean sustainability since 2020 has had that big spike in uh, conversation and I think that's only going to uh, incredibly grow as this becomes um, a more global issue um, addressed at many different levels. And I think, you know, with the communications, what we're seeing is that peer to peer uh, communication and maybe and we can have a think through about how universities and higher education institutions might be listening to that um, and adapting their own uh, strategies internally. So that leaves us to our final speaker, Dr. Esther Lukács, who is the Vice Rector for Educational Affairs and Director for the Centre of International Programs at Szczecini University in Hungary. One of Dr. Lucha's responsibilities has been to manage a dynamic um, expansion of the university's interna internationalization process. And today she's going to dive into the role of higher education institutions to deliver knowledge. And we're going to discover some really amazing work that's being done at her university using the framework of the SDGs. Over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for a very kind introduction. And I have already shared my screen, in fact. I should like to extend a sincere welcome to all who are participating in today's conference. In my presentation, I will be covering the following themes. When universities demonstrate a greater openness to incorporating students and graduates' opinions and needs into development policies, they can reflect an augmented level of authenticity. Students and graduates open to being educated in the area of sustainable development can inform and help to shape the policies and good practice of HEIs. In Hungary, the United Nations Association delivers initiatives to expand awareness of the SDGs amongst students with syncs with higher education's duty to deliver appropriate knowledge and skills to ensure labour market success for graduates and alumni. By working in conformance with the requirements of university's third mission, our institution strives to translate this shared vision defined by the SDGs into development plans and strategies for global benefit. And I would like to go to the next slide, please. Uh, I have examined the concerns of the graduate and front employees as revealed in the results of an attitude survey conducted by the German multinational tech giant present in Hungary, a company with a proven eco-conscious profile. 
The latter survey confirms the results that were delivered in AMA's splendid presentation. Uh, survey results reflected Generation Z's concerns and needs, young employees who are less motivated by earning potential and more driven by sustainability issues and demands for workplace flexibility. They also show an openness to alternative forms of further education and training. Graduates desire a decent workplace to advance their careers, a life path, in fact. In conformance with the SDGs 8, the support inclusive sustainable economic growth with full and productive employment and decent work for all. Accordingly, HEIs are expected to provide the necessary knowledge and skills to enable graduates to have a soft landing on the labour market. On a personal level, as a long-standing board member of the United Nations Association of Hungary, I am fully aware of my own responsibility for the implementation of the SDGs. The World Federation of United Nations Associations is a global non-profit organization representing and coordinating the membership of over 100 national United Nations associations and their thousand constituents. The current president of the UNAH was the 15th permanent representative of Hungary to the United Nations in New York under 2020. United Nations Association of Hungary successfully realizes its prime outreach to universities in the form of UN Academies lecture series on UN agenda issues, which aim to provide essential knowledge for students to adapt their mindset in a changing world. United Nations Association of Hungary conferences also contribute to the formation of students' eco-consciousness and attitudes to work. In 2019, to celebrate the centenary of the International Labour Organization, Sechen University, in collaboration with UNAH and the ILO Country Office for Central and Eastern Europe, organized a conference titled The Future of Work and the Employment for the Future. The work of the ILO focuses on promoting rights at work, encouraging decent and productive employment, enhancing social protection and strengthening of social dialogue. Reflecting our concern to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development, our university naturally gives priority to SDG 17. As a point of interest, Choba Kuroshi, the head of the Directorate for Environmental Sustainability of the Hungarian President's Office, was previously head of the working group that elaborated the SDGs, himself endorsing SDG 17. We recognize the validity of all the SDGs, however, as it would be impractical to concentrate on the 17 areas covered by the goals, it is essential to prioritize. For this reason, we have selected to focus on the following five goals relevant to our mission. SDG4 promotes quality education for all. Educational institutions that do not offer quality education and research thus failing to contribute to well-being of the wider community are doomed. The realization of SDG 8, advocating decent work and economic growth, is vital for ensuring the full employment of graduates. As an HEI vitally driven by infrastructure development and with a science and innovation park currently under construction, we pay enhanced attention to the implementation of SDG 9, which aims at building resilient infrastructure, promoting sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. Our concern with reducing inequalities as formulated in SDG 10, whether to the economic factors, gender issues, or 
rural urban background plays an integral role in the formulation of our policies relating to the student community. In the light of SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, we maintain a close collaboration with the municipality and also strive to contribute to the conservation of our cultural heritage. Thank you for giving me the time and your kind attention. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so now we've come to the question part of uh, our of our of our panel and if you have questions please do um, forward them over to us and I think to get us started I think um, one of the themes that kept being uh, mentioned was just how much students expectations and perspectives have changed particularly since the pandemic um, I heard that they're on social media 60% uh, more I've heard they're demanding flexibility um, their perceptions are changing they're expecting universities to respond to them instantaneously outside of business hours are, read, are universities ready for this shift? Um, and you know, what, what needs to happen if not? Um, Emma and um, Esther, any, any thoughts from your perspective? Actually, Rachel, I'm going to be very honest if I may go first. Uh, at a university, we are focusing on our employment and we do focus and concentrate on employing the young generation actually to find the student voice you may need to work with young people who are at my great help. So actually, I am in the university studio. I'm sitting in the university studio uh, right now, surrounded by my wonderful colleagues who helped me deliver the lecture. And actually, I need to confess, they are all much younger than myself. They are all below 30. And actually, this is a help, um, what I'm relying on. I can definitely imagine that. Um, Emma, any thoughts from your perspective? I think I've, I've been incredibly proud of the shift that I've seen, actually, you know, particularly um, in, in more developed nations where we, we you know, but work uh, globally. Um, and we, we, of course, work with institutions across Canada, the United Kingdom, the US. Um, and I think traditionally universities wrongly have been seen as be, being quite sort of bureaucratic, perhaps slightly risk averse. Um, and, and quite hierarchical institutions where perhaps there is a reluctance to embrace new technology and to embrace change in, in the way that we do things and particularly the way we communicate our, our values and, and we engage with prospective students. There's definitely been a very uh, sort of rigid timeline to the way in which we communicate and at what point in the student decision making journey. Um, but I think what we can see now is this agility and creativity that universities have embraced, um, particularly over the last 18 months. I think it was coming anyway, but I think it's been accelerated at a rate that I think none of us could really imagine. That's through the way the methods of our teaching and online communities. That's also in the way that we recruit and engage with prospective students as well as the current student population. But actually, I think universities have coped very well. I think we've seen a variety of different methods that they've employed uh, to enable uh, more flexibility in terms of information, whether that's through chat bots, whether that's through peer to peer engagement, whether it's making staff more accessible online, um, sharing sort of uh, greater methods of contact details, but also hosting virtual and digital events, which as today's session will be, you know, is accessible on demand and enables students to engage at a time that's perhaps more, more convenient and, and suitable for them and to do greater amounts of research across a greater number of institutions. So I think choice for young people um, is becoming even greater than perhaps it once had been. They're not limited to attending a few open days across that decision making journey. They can now do far greater amounts of research across a wide variety of platforms and channels. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful point. I mean, I think the events, particularly like this one, is far more inclusive because it is on demand. Um, you can consume it in your own time. You can balance that flexibility. Um, I know that in a, in a business setting and, and perhaps other people in the audience might recognise this, we're experiencing a bit of a digital fatigue, a bit of a Zoom fatigue. Um, we're very confined to the virtual event here. And I think, Emma, you touched on the, the need for that you know, human interaction that is still incredibly important. And I think Esther, your point that you're surrounded by your 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 young dynamic team supporting you in your uh, studio there. Um, when we start thinking about sort of digital fatigue and balancing work life, is that sort of coming up as a as a as a, as a consideration for students? Um, you know, how do we once we emerge from this pandemic, we increasingly are able to get back to our 
our normal lives, how will this sort of bed into um, the future of, you know, students' perspectives? Yes, thank you, Rachel. I'm going to be very honest, that's a far-reaching question because that touches up on the mental health of both students and both university professionals. Actually, we are absolutely prepared for that issue. We have a collaboration with the local hospital. So actually the city, which is located in the northwest of Hungary, has 130,000 inhabitants and there is one local county hospital. And actually the Department of Psychiatry and mental health is in close relationship with the university and we are very happy to organize preventive programs for both our students, Hungarian and international, as well as to academic staff and professionals. We need to be prepared for the mental health of the young generation and obviously our colleagues. I think that's an excellent point. Is that something that's coming up in the in the unibody system, um, Emma? Mental health and sort of this more greater awareness of sort of you know work life balance. Absolutely. Uh, and again, we do look at conversational trends and sort of almost do keyword searches uh, amongst the the conversational data at a very generic aggregate level, of course. Um, but what we have seen is students are asking questions about counselling services. They're asking about what provision is available from an institution, whether that's academic skills centres, whether it's study support, whether it is uh, counselling and mental health and wellbeing services. And there is very much an expectation that these are uh, accessible on campus and on site as far as, as, as possible with institutions that operate in a campus environment. So I would absolutely echo what Esther is saying, is that I think the, the toll that has been taken through, through a very tricky period is, is again changing the priorities of what students focus on when making those decisions about higher education, less so about um, facilities, clubs, societies, the social aspects. There are certainly an increase in the number of questions and queries that are directed specifically to seeking out uh, mental and, and, and physical health support within the institution and how that's going to be provided. Um, and, and very much like the, the, the initial outbreak of COVID, we saw a, a big spike in the number of students asking about deferral, about asking about um, gap years, about um, you know what, what the process would be if they decided not to take up their, their place in higher education. I think there's been less of an impact than we initially expected, actually, in, in relation to that. Um, application numbers and enrolment figures haven't taken the dip or decline to the extent that I think the conversational data might have uh, initially demonstrated. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very much seeing, uh, echoing Esther's point, um, that that's a key priority for, for students and individuals, as well as employees of institutions as well. I think that's a great point. I didn't even think about deferrals. Um, obviously, people who would be planning on taking up, you know, absolute internships and, and other programs would obviously um, have to have delayed that as well. Um, and I think that's an excellent point. Um, we've touched on sort of Hungary's dedication to the SDG framework with the, the, the UN association there. Now, I think the SDG as a framework is very much um, uh, sort of getting wider recognition, but in some areas it's not particularly well known. I think in uh, Northern America, for example, we don't necessarily see the same traction as we do in Europe. Um, do you have any sort of geographic kind of um, uh, aspect about the SDGs playing a role in, in what you've been doing, Esther? Actually, it's not necessarily geographic. As I said, we needed to prioritise and we did prioritise on an institutional basis. So actually, we did prioritise on the basis for what our university is responsible for. And actually, the knowledge, the background knowledge on the SDGs highly depends on the United Nations associations in specific countries, because in some countries, these organizations operate as NGOs. In other countries, they are affiliated to the ministries of foreign affairs. So actually, it's an, more like an institutional question than a geographic question, but obviously, uh, it has huge relevance, as you have mentioned. Yeah, 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 I can definitely see that. Um, I think as we're sort of um, running out of time, um, I might ask you if you would like to give some, some final, final thoughts on perhaps where you see the future going for students. Um, we've seen the trends, you've given us great insights and, and some data. Um, as you've both mentioned, sustainability now since 2020 is 
dramatically rising in terms of prioritization, green issues. I think as a global community, we all need to take action. Um, is there anything that you kind of see that, you know, we need to, as a collective um, sector, really address or help um, our students to really um, achieve their potential within the context of sustainability? Actually, I only have got one single takeaway message. I'd be massively, massively happy if SDGs could be incorporated into the curricula of all universities, all the 25,000 universities of the world. So I'd be massively happy and pleased. And thank you for giving up the platform for endorsing this issue. I kind of like that. You've issued a call to action. We're going to put education in there. We're going to get the SDGs front and center. I love it. Emma, any thoughts from your perspective? A slightly different take. I think what I'd like to see is that we are able to sustain the new sort of digital initiatives that have been embraced. And I think going forward, how we can work as institutions to have a sort of hybrid uh, of events and activities. And I think we touching on Esther's point about sort of mental health and about employee burnout or digital fatigue, we've got to make sure that we have the resourcing in place to deliver. I think there's a concern amongst marketing and recruitment teams engaging with prospective students about how they can actually deliver, continue to deliver the vir virtual and digital events at the rate that they have over the last 18 months, but then also supplement that with the human interaction and the face to face, more traditional activities of campus tours, open days, taster events, school visits. Uh, recruitment fairs and and of course I am I'm equally concerned that what we don't want to do is double the workload of individuals that are already highly stretched within institutions so perhaps getting the message across that what we don't have to do here is duplicate this isn't about offering this event and then also replicating it in an online environment to make it available on demand it's about looking at the the key benefits of each type of activity that's offered, whether that's face to face or whether it's online, to ensure that we offer the right types of events and information in the right channels at the right time in perhaps what might be the most useful uh, manner for students to consume that information, but not let staff feel that they have to double the workload and replicate every event and activity that they might have once offered in a digital forum uh, in addition, because that would not be sustainable for staff and for institutions. So we do need to, to, to ensure that we come up with a hybrid world that caters for all uh, as far as we possibly can using what we've learned over the last 18 months. So that's what I'm hoping we'll be able to achieve is, is something that we can continue to, to deliver, but in a way that, that is, is manageable for, for staff and employees and colleagues alike across all of our educational establishments across the globe. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point to, to end on here in that we're, you know, we're revisiting the student experience, um, given those great insights that you've shared. Um, and that's not going to be a, a digital plus a plus a physical plus a hybrid event, it's going to be a custom experience. And I think, you know, moving forward, I, I'm quite excited to see the SDGs on top of the, the, the priority list. I'm excited to see maybe education being integrated across all the universities. And of course, the amazing experience where we're moving away, as you mentioned, from those glossy brochures into a custom um, experience that's going to be far more digital and inclusive and ultimately sustainable for everybody. I want to thank you both and Sabrina for, for giving us the insights, um, having a great chat this morning and to kick off day two of the QS Europe event. Um, and of course, if you guys want to, um, you know, share the link, you can obviously watch this on demand as well. Thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.